This video is brought to you by Himiway. More on that later. I'm starting off this electric bike build by making the battery first. I will use this battery case that can fit up to 70 pieces of 18650 lithium ion cells. These are MH1 battery cells by LG with a capacity of 3100 mAh at a maximum continuous discharge current of 6 amps. Before assembling the battery I am applying these insulation rings on each cell's positive end for extra protection. This is an important step when building batteries to prevent any short circuits or damage to the cells while connecting them using a spot welder. For this e-bike I am making a 14S 5P battery, which means 14 groups of cells are connected in series, each group consisting of 5 cells connected in parallel. This configuration will result in a battery with a total voltage of 52 volts and a capacity of 15.5 amp hours or 806 watt hours in total. So in theory this battery will be able to provide 800 watts of power for roughly an hour. For monitoring the voltage of each group of cells, I am using the smart BMS board with Bluetooth connectivity. It has two temperature sensors that connect to the board. I will glue one sensor in the middle of the battery pack using temperature conductive glue. This fiberglass leaf will ensure that the cable running inside the battery won't cause any shorts between the cell groups. A piece of Kapton tape will hold the sensor in place until the glue dries. I glue the second temperature sensor to the positive end of the battery. With all the cells in place, I can press down the second half of the bracket. To weld the cells together, I am using this secure spot welder. It is a good quality spot welder that I have used on my previous builds with great results. This spot welder is powered by a LiPo or a car battery, so I am using two LiPo batteries connected in parallel for more capacity and higher output current. Before making the welds on the battery pack, I always do a few test welds on dead batteries to see what weld pulse duration gives best results. I am using a 6mm wide and 0.1mm thick pure nickel strip for the connections. With an 18ms pulse I am getting pretty good welds. Using scissors I cut up the nickel strip into the right size pieces and start the spot welding of each group of cells in parallel.
With one side of parallel connections done, I repeat the same on the other side. With the parallel connections done on both sides, I move to welding the series connections starting from the negative side of the battery and moving my way up to the positive side. Once you start welding the series connections, it is really important to take extra precautions to avoid shorting the cells. Here I am applying a piece of Kapton tape across the welded part of the battery. I repeat the step of insulating the cells that are connected in series and move my way up to the positive side of the battery. As the battery cells are now connected in parallel and series, I am welding these thin tabs on each cell group. There will be 15 tabs in total, 14 tabs from the parallel groups and one as a positive connection from the battery. They will be used to safely solder the balance wires to the BMS board. A strip of adhesive insulating paper is placed on top of the cells. I now check the placement of the balance wires and solder each one to the corresponding group starting with the black wire on the negative side of the battery. Because this BMS board is made to connect up to 22 groups of cells in series, I need to modify one connector accordingly for my battery. Once the balance wires are soldered to each cell group, I place a few strips of adhesive foam where the BMS board will be. First, the B- cable on the BMS needs to be connected to the negative side of the battery. Once again, I protect the battery welds before doing any work that includes conductive tools or materials. Here I am welding a few pieces of nickel strip which will make a good connection to the B- cable. I can now apply the insulating paper on both sides of the battery. Because the battery case comes with a small charging port meant for small currents, I will replace it with this 3-pin charging port. I make the hole slightly bigger using a step drill bit and insert the charging connector with the wires already soldered.
I insert the switch which will be connected to the BMS board later and insulate the contacts with a bit of liquid tape. I now remove the power connector from the battery mount and solder wires to the negative and positive terminals. I also solder the charging port and the battery capacity indicator wires to the battery power terminals. With the battery installed on the base, I connect the positive battery terminal to the power output terminal. I now connect the C-minus cable of the BMS to the output terminal. This cable also connects to the negative pole of the charging input. I am now connecting the switch wires to the BMS to act as a secondary on-off switch. I insert the temperature sensor plug and the balance wire connectors as well. Using this app, I can now connect to the BMS board and monitor the voltage of each cell group, temperature of the BMS and inside the battery, turn the battery on and off remotely, see the estimated charging time and configure many of the parameters available. With all the cables secured, I install the top part of the case. Because the BMS board is slightly thicker, I heat the top of the case with a heat gun until the plastic is soft enough to conform to the shape of the BMS. With the screws holding the two parts together, the battery is finished. Before moving on to the e-bike build, I would like to talk about this video sponsor, Hemiway. Here I am unboxing one of their most popular e-bikes, the Cruiser. It is a fat tire e-bike with 26 inch wheels, a powerful geared Befang motor in the back and a large 840 watt hour Samsung battery that is estimated to provide a range of up to 60 miles or 96 kilometers. The wide 4 inch tires make this e-bike a versatile cruiser not only for daily commutes but for fun rides in the forest, by the beach or even on snowy roads and allows for easy climbing up steeper hills. You'll find a Himaway branded cap, the front axle, a pair of aluminum pedals, decent quality tools, a 2 amp charger and an instruction manual. To assemble the cruiser you'll need to mount the handlebars, install the front mudguard along with the LED headlight and the front wheel and attach the pedals. It comes mostly pre-assembled and it takes less than an hour to have the bike ready for its first ride. 
Despite the minor drawbacks that I see on this e-bike like the mechanical disc brakes and the basic Shimano drivetrain, I can definitely recommend it as a great value all-terrain e-bike that will ensure an enjoyable ride even on the roughest roads. Tighten a few bolts that hold the rear rack and you're good to go. The Hemiway Cruiser frame seems to be high quality and combined with the spring-loaded forks in the front provides a really comfy and enjoyable ride. The battery is 48 volts and 17 and a half amp hours with genuine Samsung cells and weighs roughly 4 kilograms. The geared Bafang motor provides amazing torque and quick acceleration to speeds of up to 40 kilometers an hour or 25 miles per hour. The drivetrain is rather basic and comes with a 7-speed Shimano derailleur and freewheel. The Tektro mechanical disc brakes work well with the 180mm rotors front and back. The cruiser can be ridden using the throttle only but also offers pedal assist levels for a smoother ride. The large LCD display shows your speed, distance and remaining battery and is well visible in direct sunlight and can be programmed to suit your power needs. The adjustable saddle height and soft cushioning ensures a comfy ride on longer journeys even for tall riders. The plywood rack with the Hemiway logo engraved gets an extra point for me for style and a more rugged look. After riding this e-bike for a few weeks I can say that it exceeded my expectations considering its price point. You can feel that the cruiser has lots of torque from the start and can get you through most terrains including steep climbs. It reaches the maximum speed of 40 km an hour in around 10 seconds using the throttle only and the advantage of the geared hub motor allows you to cruise with very little resistance unlike the gearless hub motors. On a full charge and riding the bike on a flat road at an average speed of around 35 km an hour with minimal pedaling, I reached a range of 55 km or 34 miles which is pretty close to the advertised range and quite impressive for a heavy fat tire e-bike like this. Link to the Hemiway Cruiser is in the description. Thank you to Hemiway for sponsoring this video. For the e-bike conversion I decided to use this hardtail fat tire mountain bike. It is a white 2 Fat Pro model that I bought used for a low price and as you can tell the condition of it is not perfect. The paint is worn off in different places, there is many rusted and missing parts but despite that it is just what I was looking for to fit a mid-drive e-bike kit. As with every e-bike build I like to completely disassemble the bike, inspect the parts to see if any need replacing and thoroughly clean each component. I decided to go with a mid-drive option so I chose the Bafang BBS-02 unit from a trusted supplier, link in the description. The drive unit is rated for 750 watts but is capable of over 1200 watts by programming the controller. It is rated for a 48 volt battery but works with a 52 volt battery as well. Before placing an order for a mid-drive unit like this, you need to check the width of your bike's bottom bracket. Since mine is a fat tire bike, I needed a unit that fits a 100mm wide bottom bracket.
In the kit you'll find a front chain wheel, cranks, a set of tools, magnetic brake sensors, mounting brackets, a speed sensor, a throttle handle, cable extension, and LED headlight and a display. I chose the 500C color display. With the bike completely disassembled, I cleaned each component and spray painted a few parts that were rusty. To mount the battery to the frame, I measured the diameter of the bike's frame and designed these 3D printed holders that will fit around the tube of the frame. They will be held in place by zip ties and should make a stable platform for the battery base. These can be used as spacers to utilize the bottle gauge mounts as mounting points. I'm using my soldering iron to press in a threaded insert that will create a mounting point on the frame. I'm adding a strip of adhesive foam for more grip against the frame. Before tightening the zip ties, I check if the holders sit in a straight line. I'm adding an XT90 connector on the battery mount with a bit of liquid tape for protection against water. Two longer M5 bolts will go into the bottle cage mounts and two shorter bolts into the threaded inserts of the holders. I 
I'm adding an XT90 connector on the Bafang motor power cables and a thin spacer on the bottom bracket before mounting it onto the frame. The mounting plate with the ridges facing the frame goes on the non-drive side with the two bolts that are hand tightened for now. I tighten the inner locking ring once the motor is pressed against the frame with a piece of rubber underneath. The bolts holding the bracket can now be tightened and the outer locking ring installed. I chose the 48 tooth chain ring for a higher top speed. Getting a higher tooth count on the motor will increase the top speed but will reduce the torque when using the largest sprocket in the back. I apply a bit of grease on the axle and install the cranks. I'm replacing the tire and the tire liner on the wheels. This bike came with 160mm brake discs, so I am replacing them with a new set of 180mm. The cassette on the rear wheel is a 10 speed and seems like it hasn't been used but I will replace it with a barely used 10 speed cassette that has a bigger tooth count on the largest cog. With a larger cog in the rear, the bike will be able to climb uphill much better. I will use this Shimano Dior derailleur with a clutch for better shifting.
even though it is not necessary, I highly recommend you install a shift sensor like this. It will cut off the power from the motor when shifting gears to extend the lifetime of your drivetrain. I will keep the stock Shimano brakes, so here I am bleeding the brakes using fresh mineral oil. I've printed these adapters to mount the brake sensors more easily. The magnet sits inside this two-part holder which clamps on the brake lever. Because the headlight that comes with the Befan kit is only rated for 3 watts and uses 6 volts supplied by the controller, I wanted a front light that would be much brighter. So I got this cool looking LED headlight that is supposedly rated for 20 watts. I will wire a 3 position switch to turn on the outer ring or the main beam using waterproof connectors. Here I am disassembling the light to see if it is actually waterproof and if there's any thermal paste between the LEDs and the housing. Seems like there's only a drop of paste inside so I will apply a bit more for better heat transfer. The magnetic brake sensors are attached along with the thumb throttle, the LCD screen and the light switch on the handlebars.
To attach the headlight to the handlebars, I designed and printed these mounts on my Ender 3 V2 that fit the included nut and bolt. I thought I would mount the headlight upright, but it looks much better when facing downwards. Because the headlight will be mounted upside down, I am rotating the clear lenses to keep the beam at the correct angle. The stock LED headlight that comes with the Befang kit is powered by 6 volts, so I will use this low voltage supply to trigger a relay instead. The relay will provide the DC step down converter with the battery voltage and drop it to 12 volts for the headlight. I designed this case for the converter and relay which will mount to the frame. I thought of running the 12 volt supply cable from the top at first, but decided to move it to the bottom for nicer cable management. Because the relay will provide the battery voltage to the converter, I solder a waterproof connector to the battery mount cable. Here I am mounting the speed sensor. It works by sensing the magnet passing by with each rotation of the wheel. With the speed sensor installed, I wrap the cables of the motor in a plastic sleeve. Installing a pair of plastic pedals with a bit of grease on the threads, following with the saddle next. With the relay case mounted to the frame, I connect the 6 volt output from the motor and the battery power supply.
I've also 3D printed these cable mounts and shortened the main wiring harness. With the cable secured, I can connect the plugs together, leaving the green plug of the controller unconnected for now. These cable spacers will make the cables look a bit more organized and tidy. Here I am connecting a programming cable to the green controller plug and installing the battery. The cable lights up red and it can be plugged into the computer to configure the parameters of the Befang motor. The programming is fairly simple, there's many recipes online that can be loaded into the software for best performance of the motor. The programming allows you to change the current limit, pedal assist power levels, speed limit and many other parameters to make the Befang kit much more fun to ride. With the controller flashed, the cable can be unplugged and the display connected. With the battery in place, the display is turned on, bringing the completed e-bike to life. To me this is one of the best looking displays for this kit. It is compact, yet easy to see the main parameters while riding. To my surprise the display has a haptic feedback, so it vibrates with each press of a button. The display is programmable, so I change a few parameters like the battery voltage, wheel size and the speed limit. You can even set a password on the display. The brake sensors are working and showing on the screen when the lever is pressed. The headlight is switched on by holding the button on the display, making the relay inside the case switch on and off. Using the three position switch, either the outer ring or the main beam lights up. With the protective film removed, the e-bike is finally ready for its first ride. After riding the bike for more than 100 kilometers, I can say that this is probably my favorite e-bike build so far. Weighing at just over 24 kilograms in total, it delivers great performance, a top speed of around 50 km an hour and lots of torque which is able to push me through most of the steep climbs. The fat tires provide significantly better grip when riding through sand or forest and the large 10 speed cassette increases the bike's capabilities of higher top speed and higher torque uphill. Because this video got quite lengthy on its own, I will upload a separate test and comparison against the Himuway Cruiser to see if it's really worth building your own e-bike like this one. I will test the range, speed and riding performance of both bikes. I hope you will consider subscribing to my channel to be notified and I'll see you on the next project.